We're going to notice today God's message to the seven churches. Last week we dealt with the first of the three, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos. And today we're going to continue as we study the actual words of Jesus given thousands of years ago to the church. We're going to notice today that these words, even though they're thousands of years old, are very relevant to the church today and are relevant to your needs and are relevant to my needs. As we noticed last week, the seven churches, starting with Ephesus and finishing with Laodicea, not only talk about local conditions and in certain localities, but those seven churches describe the history of, of the church of the living God from the days of, of the apostles down to the last day. Therefore, most commentators believe that the church of Ephesus, while it has a message that is universal for all people for all, ta all time, talks specifically about the church in the first century, while the last church is represented by the church of Laodicea. Now today, we're going to talk as we study the church of Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and the church of Laodicea. We're going to study today the story of the great harlot who seduces the servants of God. We're going to talk about the church of the beautiful corpses. We're going to talk about the naked and the blind Pharisee and the man who knocks at the door. And so would you please open your Bible to Revelation chapter 2 and verses 18 to 20, if you don't mind. Revelation chapter 2 and verses 18 to 20 in the Word of God. The last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20 and onwards. Now Jesus says, now these words are important because these are the actual words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us start at verse 18 of Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, this was a city in Asia Minor like all the rest of these cities, but this was probably the least important of all the cities of, of Asia Minor. It was a city of apparently small consequences. And God says to the church, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things uh, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. This is a picture of Jesus the Lord and Jesus the Judge. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. And so this is a church that has a lot of things going for it. God says, I know your works, and I know your faith, and I know your patience, and I know your love, and I know that you've got more works now than you had when you started out. But God says, you have a problem. And verse 20, he says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality and to commit things and to eat things that are sacrificed unto idols. Did this church really have a woman in her midst whose name was Jezebel? Most unlikely. The book of Revelation is first and foremost a book of symbols. And that is why when God starts to, to give this book, he says, uh, put in wor there that word signified. And so John says, God sent and signified these things by his angel to his servants. And so this is a book that has been signified. It is a book of signs. Now, who was Jezebel? Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, who lived back in the days of Elijah. And the Bible tells us something very interesting about Jezebel. Not only was she a promiscuous woman, but she was a sun worshiper. And through the influence of Jezebel, the worship of, of Baal, sun worship, was brought right into the very heart, into the very camp of the, of the church of God, the church in the Old Testament. 
And God says, I've got something against you because you have this woman Jezebel and you've allowed this woman Jezebel to seduce my servants. Now, now most commentators, including myself, believe that Jezebel portrays the great church of the Dark Ages. And this, of course, is the church that was joined to the state and the church that actually brought sun worship into the kingdom of God. The Bible tells me that this was a, a very, very difficult time for the servants of God. This was the church of the Dark Ages. And during those days, Christianity became paganized. It has been said, and rightly so, that, that Christianity not only conquered Rome, but Rome conquered Christianity. And what happened to the church in the days of the Middle Ages was that the church became a paganized society. It still called itself the church of the living God, but it had there a woman in the midst, and the Bible said her name was Jezebel, and she was symbolic of the harlot church. History tells me that into the church during the Middle Ages came the worship of relics and holy bones and the keeping of Sunday. And you say, what is wrong with those things anyhow? The problem is, my friend, they're not found in the Bible, but they came from the religion of the sun god. You know, I've actually seen the, the, the remnants of, of sun worship when I was visiting, as, as some of you folks have done, when I was visiting the great church in Rome, St. Peter's Cathedral, there you will see the high altar. And high up above the high altar and just behind the high altar, as plain as the nose on your face, is a great symbol of the sun. And when I went and looked at some of the, the crucifixes, I have the pictures of them taken out of the, out of the, out of the Vatican itself. There you see the, the rays of the sun. And this symbol has come right down to our own day, and it has come from sun worship. You see it today in hot cross buns that are stamped with the T, that is the symbol of Tammuz, and you see it on the cross that has a circle around it because the circle is the symbol of the sun. And into the church came Sunday and infant baptism and purgatory and the worship of relics and, and prayers for the dead and uh, all of these things that you won't find anywhere taught in the Bible. And the Bible says, I know you've got faith, and I know you've got love, and I know you've got works, and he's talking there to the true servants of God, but he says, I know you've got something else, and you don't need it. You've got that woman Jezebel in your church. And she has brought into your church the paganism of Baal and the paganism of the sun god. Now, my friend, I don't think there are too many commentators who would disagree with this. And I want to say to those who are watching us on television, don't get mad with me particularly because what I'm telling you is the truth. This is the truth. Some people get mad because they hear the truth. I want to say, my friend, we've got nothing to fear from the truth. You hear this? And what we need, my friend, is a faith that is based not upon superstition, but a faith that is based upon the Word of God. Now, I, I want you to know that I believe the vast majority of God's children are tied up in that system. I believe that the ma vast majority of God's children keep Sunday. I believe that. I believe the vast majority of God's children practice the baptism of babies. I know that is so. And so I believe that they are a part of the church of the living God and Jesus loves them. And I believe that they're going to be saved as they walk in the light. But God says here, I've got something against you because you tolerate that woman Jezebel. I want to say to you today, we should not tolerate any of the remnants of sun worship in our churches. Now, if you go back to the Bible, you'll find that God has a message that goes on a little further as he talks to the church 
of Thyatira, and as he talks, I think also to you and to me. He says, verse 21, I gave a time to repent. That's the mercy of God. God gives us time. Now, my friend, if I'm wrong on some of these things, all I say to you is this, come and tell me where I'm wrong. That's all I ask. But don't get mad with me, but come and tell me where I'm wrong. And I say to my, my, beloved, my beloved friends who keep Sunday, God loves you. But if I'm wrong on this business about the Sabbath, don't get mad with me, but come and show me where I'm wrong in the Bible. Come and say to me from the Bible, we can give you a text that tells you that Jesus changed the Sabbath. We can give you a text that tells you that Sunday is the Lord's day. We can give you a text that says that the Sabbath was nailed to the cross and my friend, I will become a Sunday keeper and I'll stop keeping the Sabbath. I want to be clear on this issue. I want to be true to God, but I want to tell you folks, I've read this old book through not once, but I've read it through a hundred times, and there's not a word in the Bible that tells me to keep Sunday or to break the Holy Sabbath of God. And God says, I've got something against you because you tolerate that woman Jezebel. And some of us have tolerated the children of Jezebel and the teachings of Jezebel for too long. God says, verse 21, I gave a time to repent of her sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality in this context refers to an unholy alliance with the world. And she did not repent. How did God give to the church of Thyatira an opportunity to repent? Does anybody know? He did it through the Great Reformation. God raised up men like Martin Luther and, and John Knox and those men went to that church, and those men preached the Word of God, and that church rejected the Word of God. God says, I gave her opportunity, but she didn't want it. She didn't repent. Verse 23 says, verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the, the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. But to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, and to as many as do not have this doctrine, and who have not known the depths of Satan, as they call them, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the potter's vessel shall be broken to pieces. I've also received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. That is a reference to Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen, can I say this to you? If I can somehow appeal to your hearts today, listen, love is tremendously important. It's the most important thing you can have in a church. Faith and good works that are the fruitage of a right relationship with God. But fidelity to doctrine and truth is tremendously important. You may say, it doesn't matter what a person believes as long as that person loves God. You won't find that idea taught in the Bible. Amen. God says, you've got a woman there and she's got the old doctrine of Baal and the doctrine of the sun God. He says, get rid of that woman. Don't allow her to seduce you. And I want to say that God is calling his church back to the teachings of the Holy Word of God. Remember, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Would you come to Revelation chapter 3 now, please? Revelation chapter 3, and I want you to notice these words, please. Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 1, and here it talks about the church of religious orthodoxy. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, 
I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. I tell you, my friend, the church of Sardis is around today. Historians would say, and I would agree with them, that while the church of Thyatira re refers to the church of the Dark Ages, the church of the Antichrist, and the church that put up with the doctrines of Jezebel, who brought the teachings of sun worship into the church, the church of Sardis refers to the, the period after the Dark Ages, when the churches came out of that system of darkness and drew up creeds and had a great and a wonderful and a perfect doctrine, but they became bereft of the Holy Spirit of God. Not only does it talk about the post-Reformation church, but it talks about many a church today. Maybe it's a message to this church today. God says, I know your works. You're pretty good on works, and I know that you've got a name that lives. It's great to have a name that lives. I know that you've got a name that lives, God says, but God says, I have a criticism of you. You're dead. You can't be saved in a dead church. I want to say this to you, and this may offend you. I don't wish to offend you. If I went to a dead church, if I could not revive that church through the preaching of the gospel, I would leave that church and go somewhere else. Hear what I'm saying? Some people are prepared to sleep with a corpse. I don't want to sleep in church with a corpse. This is a church of very dignified and very respectable corpses. But I want to tell you, a corpse is a corpse is a corpse. Hear that? And this is a church, Russ, of corpses. Easy tell when you're in a dead church, friend. Some of the deadest churches are the most respectable churches with the best choirs. Hear this? With the best liturgy, with the most distinguished pastors, uh, and the most affluent elders who love to sit up the front so they're seen. And they love to, to sing the doxology and go through all of that stuff, which is great. But you go into the church of Sardis, and as soon as you walk into the church of Sardis, you can tell you're in a cemetery. There's no power in the preacher. The preacher who's got eight PhDs on church growth and has got a doesn't, has never had a baptism, the preacher will get up and give a great dissertation on a subject like the birds of the Bible. As a friend of mine, Pastor George Burnside, said he went along to a church in Sydney, Australia, and the preacher preached on, you think, well, people are going to hell, we're living in the last days, and there's some clown up the front who preaches on the birds of the Bible. <laughs> Turn over to this text here and you read about this bird. Who cares? <laughs> My friend George Burnside said when he heard this preacher with a dozen doctorates in church growth speak on the birds of the Bible, he said, I wish I'd had a gun in the church service. I would have shot every one of them. <laughs> now, I want to say this to you. When you go to church... You should not enjoy the sermon. I have lots of people who come to me after the service, as they will today, and they say, oh, we enjoyed that. That's because they were sleeping. <laughs> Isn't this the truth? You shouldn't go to church to enjoy the sermon. You ought to go to church to get saved and go to heaven. Amen. Yeah. Isn't that true? And if you and I are living sordid, dirty little lives, we ought to go to church and get convicted of sin and we ought to feel the fire under the pews. Mm. Isn't that true? Amen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You say it a bit louder and amen, amen if you want me to marry you in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Let's make it a good offering today. Absolutely. Now, 
<clears throat> I can think when I was a boy out of college, I went al along and heard a great Aussie preacher. His name was Jeff Radcliffe, one of the greatest preachers in the world. He got called over here to the United States of America to do evangelism, and he was never heard of again. That's what happens. They bury them in some church, and they don't give them any money, and they starve them to death. That's what we've done with most of our evangelists in this part of the world. I went along and heard this man preach, and that night he preached on the judgment. He preached such a strong sermon on the judgment that when I went home, I was so scared, I wondered whether I'd make it home. That's good preaching. When you go along and you hear a preacher, and he, and he just makes you feel fuzzy and warm, you might as well go along and go to Disneyland. Because Disneyland will be better anyhow because most of the time you'll be in the fresh air. It's a fact. So here is a church and it's got a name that lives and it's as dead as the proverbial dodo. I want to say to every person watching on 3ABN and the people who are, are going to listen to this video and see this video and all of the people who are watching, if you belong to a church of Sardis, I don't care how respectable it is. I don't care if it's got a great choir, and I don't care if the preacher's got rings all over his fingers and bells on his ankles. I don't care unless the Spirit of God is in that church and unless you can change that church by calling that church to repent, get out of it. Don't stay in a dead church. Hmm. The Bible says you don't have to sleep with a corpse. And so what happened, my friend, to that church? They drew up creeds and they got the church uh, manual and they got all of that stuff and they died on it. They choked themselves to death. Now in those days, and of course this church exists today, but particularly in those days, God raised up a man. His name was John Wesley. I just wish you folks could see the movie John Wesley. Of all the preachers since the Apostle Paul, John Wesley is my ideal preacher. He was only a little man. He was five foot four. Like the song, five foot two, eyes of blue. He was five foot four. I've seen his shoes about this long. A little man who wore a black clergyman's vest, a clerical collar, and his hair was down to his shoulders and usually wore a wig because that's how the preachers dressed in those days. He was a dead preacher. He came out here to convert the Americans but said, oh my God, who's going to convert me? Mm. Who's going to convert me, said John Wesley. Then you know the story, of course, where he went down to Aldersgate Lane to our little church that was sort of an offshoot off the Church of England, meaning it was a part of the Reformation. In those days, the Church of England was so dead, they had preachers that they called unpreaching prelates. You know all the preachers did? They sat in offices. And you know what the bishops did? The bishops wrote the sermons for the preachers to read. You know, I've just discovered there are preachers on television, and they read every word, that they've got script writers, can you believe a preacher on television or radio would have a script writer? I watch television programs and you see it comes up in the credits, so-and-so script writer. So the guy who was preaching it was just reading it off a video prompter. That's why you see his eyes moving back and forth. And so back in those days, the bishops were the ones who wrote out the sermons. If you had a good bishop, it wasn't so bad. But if you had a bad bishop, it was very bad. And the preachers would get up and they would read it and they would say, here endeth the first lesson. Boy, I could talk more about that, but 
seeing we're working out a nice arrangement with the conference committee, I'm just going to be so nice today. <laughs> now listen to me as I tell you something else. When John, and, and we're going to have a special meeting to tell you folks all the good news after the church today. We're going to eat together, then we're going to stay behind, and then we're going to tell you some great and wonderful news, which is not as good as the, the mine news, but it's still not too bad. On a scale of one to ten, it's a two, but it's still not bad. <laughs> now, folks, John Wesley belonged to this dead church. And John Wesley started to preach on the new birth and conversion. You know what they did to John Wesley? They tossed him out of the church. He had to preach in, in, uh, on tombstones outside the churches because he preached on justification by faith and the law of God and the Ten Commandments and the Holy Spirit. They couldn't take it. They tossed him out of the church. Don't tell me, my friend, that churches have always done what is right. The organized church in history basically has, has been on the side of the devil. Boy, people say, I don't like that. Well, you just go and read a little bit of history. I believe in the organized church, but organization doesn't save us, folks. We need organization, but it doesn't save us. Jesus saves us. Amen. And then he went down to this little church in Aldersgate Lane and he heard a poor layman who'd never been to college. God bless him, probably helped him more. Never been to the seminary and that was another blessing. That's a fact. The problem is the more preachers go to seminaries, the deader they get. They go into those institutions with a vision and they come out as dead as the professors. It's a fact. This is going to be quite a sermon when we put this on 3ABN. Danny may get sacked as well. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you something. The only problem with some of the things I'm telling you is this. You know what it is? It's true. It's true. And I have people, the reason these people want to give us, if they sell this mine, this vast sum of money, is because they say, we are tired of being told a lot of platitudes. We want to hear the truth and we want to know what is right, and we want to be saved, and we want a revival in God's church. We're sick of all the, the sham and the hypocrisy in the hot air. And so John Wesley went along and this layman got up, who'd never been to the seminary like me, and he heard him read the preface to the book of Romans by Martin Luther, and you know the words, I've tried to teach them to you. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And I felt I indeed did trust in Christ. And there was given me an assurance that he'd taken away my sins and saved me from the law of sin and death. His brother Charles was converted about the same time. And Charles became one of the greatest poets and one of the greatest hymn writers in the whole of the English world. And he wrote the hymn, did Charles Wesley Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. There's hope for the person who is in Sardis if he knows he's in Sardis, if he knows he's dead, and if he turns to Jesus. I'm talking today, my friend, about a paganized Christianity, and I'm talking about a Christianity that's not paganized, but has died of orthodoxy. Read on with me. God says, verse 4, you, you have a few names, even in Sardis, only a few who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Not a lot, friend, just a few. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. That should make you think it's possible for you to have your name in the book of life and to have it blotted out. So if you think 
and believe in once saved, always saved, you're not thinking God's thoughts here. God says, I won't blot it out, but if you do not repent, I'm going to blot it out. I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And now we come to a church, my friend, that is without rebuke. I want you to notice this, Revelation 3, 7 and 8. But to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. Does anybody know what Philadelphia means? It comes from two Greek words. What are the Greek words? Mm, come on, this will test you as to how I have taught you. Philos, what does it mean? You're getting married soon? You don't know? You don't get married now. Get another, get another preacher. I was looking for a way out anyhow because I wanted to go something else on that Sunday. Philos, it means love. And the word for brother is adelphos. And Philadelphia means brotherly love. And so God writes to a church by the name in Philadelphia and he says these words. These things says he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. That's enough to make you shout glory when you hear that text. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Theologians, expositors of the Holy Word, say that most likely I agree with them. This refers to the church that uh, existed in the days of the, of the 19th century when there was born into this world after the Reformation a holy zeal to preach the gospel. And God said to the church here, you're a church that is full of love and that's wonderful. I tell you, my friend, it's hard to beat love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Isn't it hard to beat love? I remember my daughter out at the academy had to sing a duet. <laughs> it was the first time she'd sung in public, and Julie sang, Love Makes the World Go Round. You know, beautiful song, Love Makes the World Go Round. I want to say when I had uh, that little time together with lots of you folks last Saturday night, I felt a lot of love there. People say to me, did you know it was going to happen? Folks, I have never had anything like that ever happen to me in my life. Never. Uh, it was a, a, a wonderful get-together, and I thought the items were wonderful, and I thought Helen's speech was a great speech, but I want to tell you, I can feel in that, and I want to thank all of you folks for coming, but I want to tell you, I felt in that room brotherly and sisterly love. And that is the best thing that a church can have. A church needs to have doctrine. And a church doesn't want the doctrines of Jezebel. We don't want any of that garbage. And we don't want corpses lying around sleeping in church, ma'am. But what we do want is the love of Jesus in our hearts. And when you have the true love of Jesus in your heart, you will not look down your long pharisaical nose at some stumbling brother or sister who's making some mistakes. Now God says, I've set before you an open door. And God says, when I have opened that door for you, no person can close that door. Amen. Hear that? That is the door of salvation, and it is also the door of evangelistic opportunity. I want to say to those who are listening here, I want to say to the world church, I want to say to every person here today that the blessing of God upon his church is dependent upon their involvement in the souls of men and women. Amen. You know why God has blessed this church? You know why we got a television truck? You know why we got television cameras? You know why I've got gold in my pocket today? from that mine 
Boy, I hope there's some more. Mm -hmm. They got a square mile of it, folks. Goes down a mile, too. Boy. Why have we got all these things? We haven't got such a lot, but why has God blessed us? God has blessed us because we have put our money into the preaching of the gospel. God has blessed this church because we have put what we've got into Russia and Los Angeles and around the world. You can't outgive God. You want to know how a church dies? You want to go and see a church die? I've seen heaps of them. You know all they do? Well, they have this philosophy. Get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on the lid. <laughs> Ever heard that? Get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on the lid. I know there are churches, and I won't say where, but they've got heaps and heaps and heaps of money in the bank. They have. Got millions of dollars in the bank. You know why they got it there? In case anything ever goes wrong. They don't have to wait for something to go wrong. It's already gone wrong. They've all died. Mm -hmm. God says, I've set before you an open door. I've opened it, and no man can shut it. But God says, I've got nothing against you. But he says in verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews, and this is talking in a spiritual sense, spiritual Jews, those who say they are believers, those who say they are Christians, those who say they are saved, and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. He's talking here about the great bundle of hypocrites that are going to get burned up. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. I want to make a comment here on the Great Tribulation. This is rather important because the Bible has a very interesting expression here, and this expression can only really be understood if you go to the Greek. The Greek says in verse 10, I will keep you, I will save you out of the great time of trouble. Now what's the difference? Well, some people believe that the church is going to be raptured and they're all going to go home to glory, and so the church is not going to keep, go through the Great Tribulation. And so they say this is the text that proves that God is going to keep us from the hour of trial. It's a very selfish idea, of course. When you go and talk to the Russians, they say, you know, if the Americans believe that, we wish they'd come over here because we've had our time of trouble. God didn't save us from it, and God is not going to save you from it either, friend. But the Greek says, I'm going to save you out of it but God's people are going to be in it so they can be saved out of it. Amen. Hear this? You know, God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by going down into the fire and saving them out of it. Amen. I don't have a lot of time for the prosperity gospel where preachers get fat and lazy on the money they take up for themselves. Don't have a lot of time for that. I don't have a lot of time for the wishy-washy gospel of the Western world that says the church of the living God is so weak that God cannot put it through a time of trouble and he's got to rapture it home to glory. I don't believe that. God sends us trouble. You know why he sends us trouble? Because we need it. And did you know this, that great blessings and great troubles go together? Amen. Let me say to you, great blessings and great troubles go together. I've had plenty of great troubles in the last four years since we have been working here in Southern California, and I've also had, glory be to God, the greatest blessings. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so if you pray for great blessings, be careful because God may load it up 
with a lot of great sorrows. Hmm? <laughs> Remember I told you last week that sorrow is God's angel. Amen. But God has said, I will be with you. And he says, I will save you out of the trouble. And ma'am, there's a Bible there if you want to use it. Now let's come on a little further. I want you folks to read the text because you get a greater blessing if you read the text. Verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now listen. We now come to the most solemn message ever given by Jesus to the church. I say this to you with sorrow, that as a people, we have largely neglected this message. We have ever only shown at lip service. When the salvation of the church depends upon it. I want to say this to you, and I want every person to understand this so that you don't misunderstand me. I believe there is a terrible heresy that is taught in many of our churches, and some of you believe it because you come and talk to me. The idea that the church, the organized church, can go, do no wrong, and the organized church is destined to be saved. Now, there's a dead silence in the church because many of you believe that Roman Catholic heresy. It is not taught in the Bible. It is not taught in the, spirit, in the spirit of prophecy. It is an idea of men, and it is a damnable heresy. Now, the church of the living God goes through to glory. Let me make that plain. But the church of the living God is known only to God. Their names are written in heaven. This building is not the church. Our institutions are not the church. The church is made up of all true believers who've got faith in Jesus. That church goes through to glory. But this idea that the denomination cannot err and the denomination goes through to glory in spite of what it does is a damnable heresy, and if you believe it, you do not have a faith that is based on the Bible. I appeal to you to give up that sinful doctrine, the doctrine of Jezebel. Now, the last message among the seven churches is the message to Laodicea. Laodicea means the judgment of the people. We are living in the hour of God's judgment. This is a message that is given to me, to my sinful heart. It is a message that is given to every Christian in these last days and specifically to those who like to call themselves the remnant church. This is how God sees his church and the destiny of the church hangs upon our acceptance or our rejection of this message. I want you please to notice it. It's a strong message. And as you know, we continue our dissertations in the book of Revelation next week. We're not going to slacken. We go into Revelation chapter 4 next week into the throne room of the universe. It's a great meeting next Sabbath. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, a person who doesn't lie. Oh, my friend, isn't it, tell me, isn't it refreshing to meet a person in this crooked age who doesn't lie? And someone who doesn't come to you with a load of phony baloney because he's after something. Oh, haven't you met him? Boy, we live in a world of charlatans, and this part of the world is the training center. 
God says, I'm going to send you someone who won't lie. When I go to church, I want to hear a man who doesn't lie. I don't want someone who says some simple little platitude, I'm okay, you're okay. Aren't we all happy today? Don't we feel fuzzy and warm? All going to burn together, friend. Mm. Yeah, well, isn't it true? Well, why don't you believe it? You turn on television on occasions and you hear some smart psychology preacher uh, giving people strokes, telling them what they want to hear. You know why they're doing it? So they'll increase their offerings so they can have a bigger house and put on more weight, get fatter. To the angel of the church of the latest sins write, these things says the Amen the faithful and the true witness. Thank God he tells me my condition. The beginning of the creation of God, I know your works. This is a church that's great on works. Works, works, works. Do, 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 cock-a-doodle-do. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. I tremble when I read that prophecy. God says to the people in Laodicea who are lukewarm, God says, I'm going to spit you out because you make me sick. Now in Laodicea, outside the city, they had hot springs and they had cold springs and they had lukewarm ones. What's a cold person? A cold person is a person who's just right out of the church. A prostitute down there on Hollywood Boulevard, she may think she's hot, but the Bible says she's cold. She's as cold as ice. Now what's a person who's hot? A person who's got the fire of God in him. Some churches today doesn't plan to preach a sermon like this because the people get all... Oh, they get all uncomfortable. They say, if I keep going there, I may have to change my dirty little life. You see? They say, give us something as lukewarm. I'm okay, you're okay, bunk. God says, you're not cold, you're not out there with the prostitutes, and you're not hot, you're just so indifferent, you're so lukewarm, and God says... I'm going to spit you out because he says, I can't stand you anymore. That's what he says. This is a strong message to the church. This church is truly orthodox. I believe in orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. I believe in orthodoxy when orthodoxy means fidelity to the truth. But this church is truly orthodox. It's not heretical. It doesn't teach heresies. It's just... So lukewarm, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. By no preacher want to preach that by himself. God says, would you like to know what Christianity is like in North America, in Australia, in these last days? God says, I've just about had so much of you, I can't take it any longer, I'm about to spit you out. God says, you say you're rich. Oh, you're rich. Well, you're increased with goods. Look at how, how wonderful we are. We don't really need anything, we're so good. God says, you don't know. That's your problem. You don't know you're wretched, and you're miserable, and you're poor, and you're blind, and you're naked. Upon the testimony given here, the destiny of the church rests. What's wrong with Laodicea? What's wrong with my church? Laodicea, on the whole, doesn't understand the gospel. Oh, Laodicea knows a bit about the character of God, Russ, but she doesn't understand the gospel. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7, the greatest of saints in Romans 7, don't look it up, he said, O oh, wretched man that I am. Why did he cry out that cry? 
because when a person goes to Christ, he sees himself as he really is. Do you want to know the mark of a Christian? The mark of a Christian is not that he's telling everybody how great he is. The mark of a Christian is that he's saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. I'm a sinner, Lord. I'm not good enough. Alan White says the mark of a Christian is this, the closer you come to God, the more wretched you'll appear in your own eyes. But this is not so with Laodicea. With her triumphalism, she is filled with the pride of the Pharisee. You read the story of the prodigal son, the boy who was the sinner, and you also read the story, my friend, of the elder brother. And the elder brother wouldn't go in. He wouldn't go in. He didn't like the good music. He stood outside, and when his father came out, he said, I've never left home. I've I've always been serving you. I've always kept your commandments. The older brother there, of course, represents the religion of the Pharisee. And the sin of Laodicea is not false doctrine. The sin of Laodicea is self-righteousness, the religion of the Pharisee. It's legalism. Can I tell you, how can I say this to you today? How can I make this plain to you? The worst sin is not the sin of sodomy, though I detest it. Detest it. The worst sin is not murder. None of those sins. The worst sin is not stealing. I heard of some people some time back in a ministry like this, and they were stealing out of the offerings. What a low thing to do. When people are sacrificing and they're stealing. What a low thing to do. But there are worse sins than those sins. The worst sin is the sin that parades itself in church and that says, thank God I'm not as others. Thank God I'm not like this publican. Thank God I'm not like this homosexual. Thank God I'm not like this adulterer. Thank God that I am an Adventist and I have the light and I'm a member of the remnant church and my name is written down on the roll. And God says, I'm about to spit you out. I can't take you anymore. I've had enough of you. You make me feel like vomiting, he says. Do you know why people in our church, and I'm talking now about the Adventist church, do you know why we are so hard on each other? We have a name among Christians for being hard on each other. You know why? Because we're Pharisees. We think we're saved by the law by keeping the Sabbath. I love the Sabbath, but the Sabbath represents the gospel, represents salvation. 